Hi, everybody, and welcome to this new episode of the Power Series. Today, we are proud to launch our 2021 predictions report, Business in the Time of COVID. The report aims to highlight some of the ways 2020 uh, forced people and institutions to dig deep and reinvent themselves. And our CEO, Diana Verdenieto, is joined by an incredible panel of guests um, today to discuss the findings in the report. Fleur Roberts, Head of Luxury Goods at Humanitar International. Alissa Auberger, Chief Sustainability Officer and Global Chair of the Consumer Goods and Retail Industry Group at Baker McKenzie. Sir Tim Smith, um, Executive uh, Vice Chairman and uh, Co-Founder of Eden Project. And Sasha Bislik, Head of Sustainable Finance at Bank Gisafra Sarazan. Please submit all your questions for the panel in the Q&A box so they can answer them at the end. Over to you, Diana. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia, and Happy New Year to everybody. 2021 promised to be, although we haven't seen it yet, slightly different than 2020, hopefully. And although, you know, many countries still in lockdown and, uh, you know, the, the political and the spectrum is not that brilliant. There is an incredible renouncement of optimism in the air. I am beyond privileged once again to be joined by an um, unbelievable panel. So thank you very much, Fleur, Alisa, Sasha, and Tim for your time today. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to um, hand the floor to Fred Roberts to really actually give us a context of what the world will look like in 2021. No pressure to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully I'll, I have some positives. Um, so uh, based on our latest research or data, um, thanks to things like weak economic conditions, uh, falling numbers of wealthy consumers, lockdowns, and of course, um, store closures, Global sales or total global sales of luxury goods declined by 16% um, by the end of last year uh, to reach just under 899 billion. Uh, so to put this in context, by the end of 2019, um, sales for all luxury goods exceeded the $1 trillion mark uh, with around 3% growth that was expected for 2020. Um, whilst some markets obviously um, hit worse than others. Um, the US overall actually saw the worst decline. Um, this spells bad news for luxury overall, given um, the importance of the US on, the, on the, the global stage, but also the fact it's the second biggest luxury market in the world. Um, whilst maybe somewhat surprisingly, as that's where the virus initially started, um, China has actually come out on top, and this is mainly thanks to things like um, re repatriated spending in mainland China, as opposed to the Chinese shopping abroad, but also pent up demand. Um, similarly, some categories are um, suffering or have suffered worse than others, so things like experiential luxury, so that's like luxury travel, luxury hotels, food service. Um, they've seen their sales decline by around 44% whilst other areas like luxury alcoholic drinks um, have actually fared relatively better at around um, zero to 1% growth. Um, so moving forward, um, the recovery will clearly be led by Asia Pacific um, with China once again at the helm. Um, and whilst we do expect to see uh, an impressive um, spike in 2021 uh, in terms of overall sales growth at around 13% growth, um, as we kind of see a return to some kind of normality, we see the vaccine being implemented um, around the world and as consumers start to travel again more, um, we do expect to see growth there. However, um, as things stand, we don't really expect to see the market um, overall returning to kind of pre-COVID levels until um, about 2022 at least. In terms of overall trends that we're seeing, um, I think everyone here can agree and your wonderful reports most definitely highlights this, but um, 2020 was clearly um, a catalyst for change. So many of the trends that we were already seeing um, in pre-COVID times so things like um, digitalization, uh, transparency, wellness, and of course the importance of sustainability and ethical living 
Um, so whilst these were already in place, what we've really seen um, and what we're seeing more and more of um, across luxury is that all of these have been kind of accelerated and catapulted um, kind of 10 years in advance of maybe where they, they would have been. Thank you so much for such a really concise and excellent uh, summary of, of the state of the world today and, and in the future. I'd like to uh, draw my attention to Ali, Alisa. I mean, um, we are incredibly proud to have partnered with Baker and McKenzie, uh, one of the most perhaps iconic uh, legal firms uh, in the world. And I leave to you to explain in your own words why uh, a little bit like the, the history of, of Baker and McKenzie and as a, as a Latin American and incredibly proud to, to be working with you. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. And thank you. We are delighted to continue to work with Positive Luxury as well. So I think what I would say is from our very inception, Baker McKenzie has always been a firm of firsts. So the first office we opened as a US law firm. So with our first office in the US was Latin America. Uh, we opened an office in Venezuela in 1955. And that's the beginning of our international expansion starting from that. Um, we're the first global law firm behind the Iron Curtain in the 80s. We were the first to obtain an operating license in China in 1993, and the first to have a presence, presence in markets on all six continents. So I think we're, I can say without any hesitation that we were actually the first truly global law firm, but it's not just geographically. So Christine Lagarde, who I think everybody knows, my former Paris partner, now president of the ECB, was the first female chair, not just of Baker McKenzie, but of any global law firm. And our current chair, Milton Chang, who is Singaporean based in Hong Kong, is the first Asian chair of a global law firm. So I guess maybe just to give you a picture of how global we are, we have more than 13,000 employees in 46 countries countries who speak over 80 languages. So for us, diversity and inclusion is really the foundation of our culture and our strategic vision. So I'd say when the founders were growing the firm, that attachment to local culture and local practice and keeping that multicultural fabric means that DNI for us is really second nature. We've always seen it as more or less a business imperative. So if I just keep on DNI, because I think it's important to where we sit in the industry today, we were the first law firm to enact global gender aspirational targets of 40% women, 40% men, and 20% flexible. So meaning women, men, non-binary by July 2025. And that applies not just to our lawyer population, but also to our senior business professionals, any committee leadership and candidate pools for recruitment. And then last year in July, we set up a global race and ethnicity task force. Again, something pretty groundbreaking to work across all of our offices to advance that. So we've always had this sort of pioneering spirit, I guess, and including in the sustainability space. So I am gonna to get to sustainability. Um, in 2015, we joined the UN Global Compact as a in 2017, we were the first law firm on the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and we were also the first law firm to collaborate with the World Economic Forum for, to launch the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution based in San Francisco. So I've been with Baker since 1998. I was an M&A partner for 15 years. I was the first global chair of our consumer goods and retail industry group, how I got to know you, and I'm now the firm's first chief sustainability officer. So responsible for leading the firm's global sustainability strategy core to our overall priorities, and as well as developing the multi-practice sustainability client offering. So that's the Baker piece, but now I wanna to turn to ESG more generally. So for me, I'd say it's really hard to identify what is the absolute standout or noteworthy factor of ESG. I say that because I think we've been, we're at a point in time where ESG has just been so shone into the spotlight by everything we've just experienced. And we're seeing this really expansive definition of ESG. So what had historically been very based on the E, on the environmental, and maybe less on the S and the G. So I'm gonna take the letters out of order and start by saying, what I think is abundantly clear from the past year is that the S in ESG has taken on massive importance, particularly in light of the, the impact that the pandemic had on workforces and on communities, as opposed to the prior focus only on that environmental pillar. So the focus here, I think, is including things beyond employees, but also really focusing on labor practices and human rights in the supply chain, but also on things like health and wellness and how that's catapulted, but it also extending to consumers and communities. So if I take another example, we've seen the S 
in things like a greater push to ensure diversity and representation in the workforce, uh, in the boardroom, and even in things like visual representation of brands. I think you know when it comes to the models, the spokespeople, advertising, it's a much broader definition. So if I take back to the E and go back to the environmental pillar, we can talk about environment and climate change goals, and which is, of course, of fundamental importance. I think everybody clearly understands, if they didn't already, the urgency around climate action. But what I think is interesting is that even when you're looking at those E issues and you're looking at climate change, you're seeing an S lens put on it. So just to take an example, if you look at recent litigation against fossil fuel companies, the claims that are being brought focus on the impact, not just on the planet, but also on the people on the planet. So really kind of this fusion of the E and the S. And then you're seeing that legislation and, and governmental guidance is clearly going in that same direction on the E and the S. Like, for example, in the EU, there's proposed legislation that would require companies to do environmental and human rights due diligence and also require reporting on non-financial issues. And then so finally, what if I get to the G, because we can't leave the G, the governance pillar, we're also seeing growing trends towards prioritizing the concerns of all, that broad stakeholder base. So what we all hear about stakeholder capitalism. So Probably a good part of the audience remembers that back in the summer of 2019, the US Business Roundtable came out with a statement that affirmed that the role of corporations can play in improving society. So I think we're seeing now the legislation, the legislation and the legislative landscape more broadly evolving and it's enabling and in some cases even requiring a corporation to really take a look and have regard for all stakeholders in their decision making processes. So to make sure that there's long term success of the corporation. So long term success for me is sustainable success. So, for example, if we look in my backyard, we've seen this in the French Pact law, the Loi Pacte, which requires company management to take into consideration social and environmental issues. We've also seen the UK Companies Act requiring directors to take account of a rather long and non-exhaustive list of stakeholders in decision making, so employees, customers, suppliers, and then how the impact of their operations, you know, what that impact is on community and the environment. And in some instances, we're even seeing legislation that requires businesses to have employee representation on their boards. So for me, the message is ultra clear. Wherever you sit on that regulatory landscape, companies and boards should already be considering that really broader social and environmental impact of their decision making. Thank you very much, Ali. And um, just taking back to Fleur said, we, we have seen like, you know, how this whole sustainability agenda has leapfrogged uh, in the last 10 to 11 months. And Ali, you are just saying that legislation is also accompanying this, this um, you know, kind of acceleration towards a better future. And it's my absolute honor uh, talking about better futures to um, kind of focus now on Tim. And Tim is probably most famous for being the mastermind behind the Eden Project. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, please go to Cornwall. Probably not right now, but when we are allowed to, and uh, and just visit it because it's an absolutely fantastic, I guess, uh, piece of art uh, from a nature perspective. And um, so, Tim. My question to you is like you're very close to the soil and you have done fantastic work uh, throughout your career to really put farming and the soil at center stage. One of the things that we have found in our report this year is the fact that fashion companies, beauty companies, in fact, all companies should think themselves more as an agricultural businesses and or mining uh, businesses. Everything that they take comes from our earth. Um, a couple of days ago, Prince Charles, a really close friend to, to Tim, um, has actually uh, launched Terra Carta, an incredible uh, charter uh, that he's done with Sir Jonathan Ives. And, and something I know that Tim has uh, uh, perhaps a really broad spectrum. So I'd like to hand it over to you um, and tell us a little bit more about what are your thoughts about Terra Carta and also what is the obligation for companies to start thinking about the soil? Right. Gosh, what a big question. Um, I'll start by saying that we have never lived in a time as exciting as we're living today. We do happen to have the misfortune of living at a time when the media have a mantra, which is if it bleeds, it leads, which means that we read an awful lot of bad news and we don't actually read a lot of good news. I think what the future will say about us right now, and this is actually where 
Prince Charles is going with his £10 billion fund. He's actually saying what most people have been feeling for years and years and years. And I would like to just point you in the direction of the stupidity of predominantly middle-aged men. I think the uh, pandemic has demonstrated beyond belief that we are not competent to run the world and that we ought to actually perhaps take a few steps uh, backward in the way we look at it. That's an apology both for me and Sasha here. This, we are obviously exceptions. Um, but if I was to be excited about where we're going, I would, I would point you in the direction of the fact that many of the battles we are facing have already been won. It's actually whether the solutions can be put in place. The soil obviously is a very thin skin around our beautiful planet uh, and it needs to be protected. And what has been discovered over the last uh, 18 months to two years has been that whereas we knew that the human biome, the bacterial makeup of the body, was an extraordinarily sophisticated um, system uh, that, that actually keeps us healthy and puts us together to the point where actually being human is almost um, a, a minority part of being uh, in the bodies we inhabit. What has been very novel has been over the last 18 months, the research showing up the extraordinary power of the biological uh, particles that are within the soil the mycorrhiza, the fungal structures that actually link everything together. Now, when I was a young chap, which was a long, long time ago, um, we were talking about, we are all stardust. We were all kind of hippie-ish and peace man. We are all made up of the same thing. Imagine being young today, realizing that in a world where spiritually, I think in terms of formal religion, we have seen a huge decline. We're living at a time when young people today are going to recognize that we are all creatures that are all linked together with the same sort of systems that keep us alive. And I think it is that that is going to make a revolution come to us, which is going to save us. I think part of the problem is that, going back to middle-aged men, is we love solutions which are to do with, oh, we're going to deal with plastics. Oh, we're going to deal with this. Oh, we're going to deal with that. When in fact, it's an attitudinal thing about the way we consume and the way that uh, we explore, if you like, the, the, the so-called circular economy. Uh, when we know that in nature itself there is no away, there is no away to throw things and we have stupidly been believing that there was and we've allowed ourselves in terms of our governance and the way we operate uh, to allow this lie to take hold. So when you're looking for example at the fashion industry, many people in the fashion industry that I know are now woefully aware that we've got to have a revolution in terms of the way we uh, we clad ourselves, the way the uh, apparel is both made, but also the materials from which it is made. I mean, it is astonishing that we have a legal framework, you know, uh, uh, Alyssa was talking uh, uh, about, about governance, which is extraordinary, that we have allowed 80,000 chemicals to get into our system, and each chemical is actually tested on its own. No one was bothered to test them against each other, so we're actually putting shit into the oceans, and we're seeing the destruction of the oceans all around us, when in fact, all of us, if we said we're not going to put that stuff in the oceans, we can heal the oceans in an incredible speed. The issue is almost a moral contract that we've got to make, which actually involves us seeing that actually the battle when in 1989, the wall came down. An awful lot of smug people thought that capitalism had won. That was in fact the start of the battle, because actually the battle is to prove that capitalism was a system that was worthy of actually leading our way into a future that still remains ours to make. So the reason I am so excited is because wherever I look, I see whether it be in the electric vehicle uh, 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 sector or our, in our own sector at Eden, we've got, uh, we are, as I speak, drilling down five kilometers to release the heat from the center of the world. We can become completely renewable uh, in a very short period of time. If only we believed that we could, we should stop listening to those middle-aged men who tell us you can't have miracles. You can. It actually requires a battle of wills which says now is the moment. And if ever, if ever there was a moment for capitalism and the intelligence that is released within that to come to the fore, it is now. One of the big battlegrounds, I think, is to do with people like me, uh, environmentalists, if you like, um, who wear the clothes of the past, not realizing the clothes of the future involve looking at some of those systems and reinventing them. So if I was to say to you, uh, do you believe that everybody on earth should have access to clean water? Most people listening today would say, yes, they should. All right, if you really do believe that, then do you believe that the lovely charities we all support, five or a week, 10 pounds a week, whatever it is, for water aid or action aid or any of these things, do you genuinely believe they are capable of delivering the thing that we wish for? 
Answer, no, you don't. In which case, ask yourself another question. Who are the people that could do it? They have names that most environmentalists hate. They're called Aramco, BP, you know, all of these things. What we need is a new discourse for a new era in which we say, actually, we don't need to demonize each other. Let's take the skills that we've got, which are incredible, and hone them to a new purpose and create a dialogue right at the center of this, which enables us to be very proud of what we have achieved. And wherever I go at the moment, I think this pandemic, other than the personal tragedies within it, has been sensational at stopping us for a moment. Most adults alive today have to not remember since the day they were five, probably, the seasons unfolding around them and making them incredibly aware of their gratitude for the natural world and the fact that they're part of it. And I see that this is not something that we're going to suddenly, the, 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 the plague dogs are gonna leave and we're suddenly gonna be free. No, I think actually most people I know in business feel that something very profound has happened and we have to now catch up with where the spiritual part of us homo sap is and make sure that the institutional, the governance uh, structures that, that shape our future are put in place to represent the people that we actually are day to day. Um, thank you for giving me uh, uh, the chance to have a bit of a rant because I am very excited and I do know that when you scratch the surface of most people, they're really, really good. What they're looking for generally around the world is people who've got a moral leadership uh, to say, you know what, let's be as good as the people we dreamt we could be when we were youngsters. So I would drink, I would raise a glass to that aspiration and thank you so much. And hello everybody, I think you're wonderful. <laughs> well, that's amazing. And I share your optimism. I mean, I'm genuinely excited every day to get out of it in the coffee normally in the morning, normally without coffee, because I feel I don't have a job. This is my calling. So I feel like you. <laughs> and but let's talk about money. Um, because obviously money moved the world and uh, I'm very excited to have Sasha with us today. Um, you know, one of the things from the report is the fact that now the most famous word uh, by the end of 2021 is not going to be COVID, it's going to be ESG. Everybody and its dog is going to talk about ESG, ENG investment, impact investment and any variations of that sort. But one of the most important parts is pensions. 47 trillion, I think it is, Sasha. I can't remember the exact figure. So the question to you is money moved the world. Uh, the investment community finally has woken up to the fact that there is the correlation about investing in companies that could potentially be stranded assets, like the combustion engine, like any cars you buy, which are you know, fueled by petrol, and actually companies that are truly innovating in sustainability. So over to you in terms of how the investment community is gonna help us, the passionate environmentalists like Tim, the people like uh, you know, Ali that helps into creating those uh, and loving for legal frameworks, and crazy entrepreneurs like uh, like me and a lot of uh, people that I know that are really actually pushing for change. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. It's very hard to sort of uh, over Trump uh, Tim. He's been uh, extremely positive and you are as well, which is very good. We need more of that in the world that, uh, that we live in, not only because of uh, COVID pandemics, but because of the fact that we are not doing enough and not enough speed to tackle one of the biggest challenges that uh, humanity is facing. When you talk about the pensions and the financial capital in general, yes, everybody's talking about ESG, but it's always there is a but. Uh, and the, this but is about a couple of things. The one is that the investment horizon of financial industry have in principle not changed. Uh, I completely agree with Tim saying that we need to stop demonizing industries and sectors and try to find a way how we can utilize the technology and the knowledge they have. So what you can see is that financial industry is nothing else than a toolbox in the economic system that basically transports capital from one direction to another, depending where it get, can get most out of it. In this particular moment, <clears throat> I think it's about maybe in principle, if we talk about the real numbers, so it's maybe about 20% of the old capital in the world that is that is managed in sustainable way to a certain degree. There's a lot of action coming out of the European Union, a lot of new regulation, a lot of these things. It will take time. But going back to what I said initially, the time horizon is still one year. 
uh, the portfolio managers, asset owners, we as a pension savers are expecting to get returns in one year. Uh, time horizon and the tragedy of a time horizon is one of the biggest challenges for sustainability and transition to sustainable future because most of the things we want companies to do will take them time and they are some, somehow in a catch-22 for the very simple reason. <clears throat> if two out of ten uh, asset managers will ask a question about how they manage their climate trajectory or how they stress test their business and eight will not ask them the question, uh, basically that will in principle mean that they will do where the, what the most capital expect them to do. That is changing, but which is not changing to extent I would expect it to, to happen. I started working with this back in 2003. And back in the days, uh, it was regarded as hippie, as tree hugging and many different things. But now it's a sort of a becoming not only the trend, but, but integrated part. What is scary is the fact that financial industry, uh, in if you compare it with a politician, is a global player. So financial industry is probably the only global citizen because it has no nationality, no color, no race, no, you know, no other adjectives that you can have as a politician. So we can move money from one part of the world to another in, a, in a nanoseconds. And <clears throat> the societal contract, and this is a very important part of this, that financial industry has with the societies operate is broken. It has been broken since 2008, and most of the people are not remembering right now because we have a pandemic about that enormous damage that, that 20, uh, 2008 has created. So the contract is broken. The trust is pretty much okay-ish, but it's not there yet, which means that the industry is facing a, a tremendous challenges, not only with the fact that the social contract, societal contract is broken, but also the fact and realization that some of the industries we invest in today are not going to be able to deliver returns we need. So everything going back to the money, what you can see is that investments in the sustainable companies, and we are an example of that, I'm, I've been doing this for 20 years, uh, is really good business because it gives you better returns. It gives you uh, outcomes in a society that are much better, but there is always but, but it takes a longer time. And it's not as quick and transactional as most of the other finances. So if somebody tells you that they will sell you investment funds that are sustainable and you ask them how do they evaluate the people who manage the money, if they tell you they evaluate them on an annual basis, you forget about it because that's not how it works because your incentive models need to change. So incentive models will need to change. The pension money in most of the countries in the world will need to be reallocated uh, and reallocated and reinvested in a way that actually is in line with the societal contract that these uh, financial sector needs to reestablish with the societies we operate. And the target and the fiduciary duty of financial industry is to support economic prosperity of the nations where we actually have our businesses. It's not only for our own gain. And this discussion, unfortunately, is not taking place right now either, I would say, in Europe because of the pandemics. And of course, the United, United States is, uh, is one of the, and China and Asia, uh, two biggest sort of economies, the things are happening on a margin, but actually not that much in reality. And just to add one thing before I end, you know, tackling climate change sometimes feels as a sort of a huge task. But if you look at the numbers, 100 corporates around the world emit 70% of all industrial emissions, 100 names. We know where they are. We know who runs them. We know who owns them. We know who invests in them. Why is it so complex to tackle this? Why do we need to impose, as Tim said, I don't know, you give a money five bucks to uh, water aid. Why don't we tackle the real sort of underlying challenges in the economic system we have? That is because the system is built that way. And if we wanna have a sort of a real interesting discussion about this, we need to start thinking about how changing the system. And that goes back to the fashion, that goes back to the luxury industry. They're all part of the ecosystem that is sort of supported by finance. It's supported by, by short-termism. It's supported by exploitation of resources that are, that are sort of a finite resources on this planet. And if you look at the, at the pyramid of who pays the price for it, it's not us, middle-aged middle men or middle-aged privileged middle class of the West world. It's the billions of people living in, a, in a developing countries. And the climate change is actually enforcing 
much more and worse inequality that will create even bigger systemic issues that we will need to that we will need to challenge. So you will have a, sort of a tremendous, interesting future, where I hope, as Tim said and many others, that the positive choices we make, because we make choices, we can afford to make these choices. Three hundred people on the planet own more capital than four point five billion individuals living on this planet right now. Three hundred individuals. So that gives you a sense of that we have a choice and we have a choice. And if we have a choice, we have a moral business obligation to deploy that choice into something that can lead to prosperity. So that will be about that. So I don't want to take more time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is a lot of food for thought. I know Tim is, uh, is applauding, absolutely. Um, and I have a question for Ali before going to the Q and A's from the floor, which is, the luxury industry, I mean, in your experience, you work very closely with the fashion and luxury as a whole. What do you think luxury industry could start doing to actually get closer to that systemic change that we imperatively need? I'd say in one word, influence. Um, for me, luxury goods, I mean, they, they, they're here to stay. I mean, they have withstood the pandemic. They have withstood the test of time. I don't think anybody's going to to contradict me if I say that luxury goods are going to stay here. And that gives them an incredible position, whether it's credibility or authenticity or ability to influence. So I would say to luxury brands that at this point in time, they have to be the leaders. They have to take the lead on ESG. So I don't know if that means using better technology to enhance transparency, um, you know, identifying where things come from, identifying the provenance of goods, or whether it means helping their suppliers improve their own practices, because it's not your tier one, it's your tier two, three, four, five. You know, you don't, con you don't just cancel a contract, help re rehabilitate, help those suppliers do better so that they don't get thrown into poverty. And I think all of that, whether it's, you know, to reduce environmental or social harms, or when it comes to really meaningful steps on diversity, well-being, showing that they actually care about that broad stakeholder base and not just that short is short termism so for me the luxury the luxury sector is probably in a very unique position to lead by example um, it will respond to consumer demand this is something consumers have been asking for for several years now this is a pre-pandemic issue and i think consumers and the world at large are putting a, a larger and larger uh, amount of pressure on esg so i think if luxury goods and luxury brands get behind this, they do have the ability to show the rest of the world how to get on track, but they have to get behind it. So in one word, it's it's influence and using their influence. Thank you very much. So moving from um, lip service to tangible, real actions in simple English. Um, I've got questions for the floor and this question, um, uh, I think it's for Sasha, but actually anybody that would like to um, add on this would be great. On investment, what do you think is the best way to hold the financial industry accountable and how to best start the conversation with the banks? Well, it's a, it's a very complex question depending who you are. If you are a private investor, I mean, if you're an individual retail investor, it's a, you can't go to your office or you can call your personal banker and start discussion about how the bank is investing your money in, in uh, sort of a companies that are on a trajectory to reach cl climate agreements set in, in Paris. Uh, and I can tell you already now, there are not so many. The world is on 3.5 degrees uh, temperature right now, uh, four actually, Europe is on 3.5, which means that if we continue doing what we do, it's get tricky. But what you can do, it's about the time horizon. And also what you can talk about is the, the time horizon that banks have and financial institutions they use how do they say, uh, see the societal contract in terms of what do they see their responsibility is in terms of investing in, in industries that are not regarded as you know, sustainable and there are a number of them. And also what do they actually do about it? Do they divest, do they invest, do they engage? Do they try to change behavior? Do they, you know, so, but I think one of the, the, the basic uh, starting points will be to get politicians around the world, including the ones in the US and in China and Europe and so on, to start holding financial industry responsible for what it does, which is not the case today. Thank you very much. Yes, Tim, please. Um, I, I totally agree with Sasha, but I'd like to be a bit more like Attila the Hun. Um, 
if, if there's one profession that I despise, it is the auditing profession because they have not moved over the last 30 years to take account of what the citizen is. It is an absolute outrage that we have a situation where the commons, as in the air that we breathe, the water in our rivers and the soil, has been treated as if it was a personal possession and that wealth could be created out of it without any penalty for the damage that's been done to it. So I think if you really want to change the world of finance, you start by changing the world of auditing. And you can do that with a very simple act. You can enforce that every company in the world has to have one golden share that belongs to its nation, which means that the auditors have to audit the national wealth in terms of the performance of that company. You watch how quickly the world would change if you did that. And there are a lot of lawyers that I know who agree with me. Alisa, I'm going to put you on the, stop, in, on the spot. Um, how can we make this happen? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, the, I think the way we can make it happen is I think there needs to be better, um, there needs to be more action. And I think there needs to be more cooperation across industries and across players. And I think that when people start banding together and not doing things in silos, they can, as a collective voice, make change. Um, it goes back to what Tim said earlier about, you know, everybody has their part to play, and that includes corporate citizens. So corporate citizens and banks and financial institutions and companies need to work together and stop this. You know, we, there's a bit of a first mover disadvantage, and that needs to stop. We need to work together in order to really affect proper change. I, don't th I think it, it will otherwise remain aspirational and not actionable. Thank you. Um this question could be for anyone, actually. Um, how much can the consumer, so take your hats, it's like we as individuals can impact and influence this broken system? Hugely. We can impact that hugely. I mean, imagine if the customers of the brands, luxury brand stuff that we actually buy, uh, starting from social media and other things that we do, if we actually act on what we say that we would act on. Uh, I have had a number of conversations with uh, very prominent brands in the Nordic region that will tell me that in the uh, surveys they do with their customers, environment and climate is very important, but when they look at the patterns of how customers are buying stuff, that uh, divergence is great. So we are, need, we are not honest to ourselves. It's like a little bit like Lord of Rings, you know, Gollum. Uh, it's a bit of a sort of, a, you know, uh, my precious. And uh, I think we are stuck a bit in the definition also what uh, luxury really is. And that's, some, that's a cultural discussion that will come probably after this pandemic. And I agree with uh, somebody that says earlier that you can actually see other values uh, being more prominent than, than that. Thank you. Um, and this is a question to Fleur, actually, um, for small businesses, I mean, you, you have so much data and exposure. What can small businesses um, should start thinking about or, or do um, as we are approaching 2021 heads on? Um, well, I think if the, this pandemic um, has taught us anything, um, it's that a luxury, healthy business has to go hand in hand with a luxury planet and a luxury society. Um, and I think, you know, consumer values, um, they were already changing. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, that, that rate of change has accelerated beyond belief. And you know, luxury companies need to adapt to these changes taking place if they want to survive. Um, and really kind of at the heart of that, and I think a lot of what we've been talking about today, whether that's from a digital, a technical, or you know, com from a complete um, kind of humanitarian point of view, um, is that innovation really is at the heart of this change? Um, yeah, and yeah, companies need to do that in order to kind of help to, to build resilience. And um, maybe going back to um, a point that I found really interesting um, in the reports, um, I think it was John. Is it John Elkington? Who said that today we should be learning tomorrow's lessons and I think you know that's really really important moving forward. Thank you and I somehow not sure how 
uh, we have run out of time. I could have spoken to you probably the whole day. So I'd like to ask you for one last thought. And I'd like to start with Alisa, please. My one last thought would be that brands need to listen to the consumer. They need to help the consumer. I hear what you say about the aspirational, what the consumer wants to do. They want to do the right thing, but then when it comes to the end of the day, their behavior might not follow. The brands need to be part of that. They need to help the consumer make the right choice. So I think the more they can invest in technology, the more they can invest in transparency, the easier it will be for the consumer to actually act on what they want to do. Thank you very much. Sasha. Well, uh, you know, I think revolution is coming. It's not going to be televised. I think it's happening in each one of us. Uh, we have a choice uh, still. Uh, remind ourselves in the, in, the, in the privileged world we live in that we are representing the fraction of the population that has, uh, you know, ability to live the life we live. And we have the, been given that uh, choice. And I think if we are really serious about treating ourselves in a balanced way with nature, we need to start acting. We are talking, we are drowning in words. So action before, uh, before words. Thanks. Thank you very much. I love that. Actually, before words, I will wear the T-shirt. Fla. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess maybe going back to the issue of consumer values and um, behaviours, um, I think more and more, you know, we are going to see a clear shift in um, consumers being more concerned about the wealth, their own wealth, whether that's their spiritual wellness, emotional wellness, physical wellness, but also you know, the wellness of the planet. I think. Um, that's really going to be profound and you know the need to restore balance I think you know that's really kind of at the heart of all of this as we move forward so restoring balance I think across the board <laughs> thank you very much Tim last word over to you um, well my last word is two words which is that I think we're about to enter a, a period of our history in which the word consumer will slowly burn and decay and will be replaced by a citizen um, an informed citizen. I think the other thing is something that Sasha said, which is hugely important. One of the key things is for us to reestablish the nobility of people and institutions that do take a long patient view on the, the heritage of future generations. Why do we plant great trees to create great avenues? They are, they are marvelous things which you cannot do in one year. And I think if we can find the right poetry to establish those sort of values, we will be making a big contribution. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you again, Fleur, Elisa, Sasha and Tim for your time today. And now I'd like to hand it over to the wonderful Claudia. Thank you. Thank you so much to our uh, panel today, Sasha, Elisa, Fleur and Tim. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you haven't already, please download our connections report now at positiveluxury.com and subscribe to our newsletter today to receive updates on our upcoming webinars. Um, thank you again for joining us and stay safe. See you soon. Bye-bye.